go ahead and introduce um, our speaker for today. Um, presentations engaging parents and teens with ADHD in clinical treatment, um, supporting teens autonomy daily, the stand model, um, which I love. Thank you, Dr. Sibley, so much. <laughs> um, so Dr. Margaret Sibley is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine and a clinical psychologist at Seattle Children's Hospital. She has authored over 90 scholarly publications on ADHD in adolescence and adulthood, including a comprehensive therapist guide to treating ADHD in teens. Dr. Sibley's research is funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and the Institute of Education Sciences. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sibley. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And take it away. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> So today my talk is gonna be focused on the clinical treatment that I've been working on with my team for the last um, 10 years or so. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what the treatment model is, a little bit about the research we've been doing on it, and um, hopefully give some time at the end for folks to engage and ask questions um, about what this work uh, has shown and is about. Um, I just wanted to throw some disclosures up here for everyone. So most important to this talk is I get royalties from Guilford Press for a manual for this treatment. Um, and you can see my research funded by NIMH right now. Um, and there's some other uh, interests on here as well um, to present to you. Uh, so with respect to ADHD, um, we've known for a long time that ADHD is a disorder that presents in elementary school age kids, and it's now becoming clear that we can detect ADHD in children as young as preschool age. Um, of course, in elementary school, this is one of the most common um, age groups for first being detected for ADHD. And um, what we've learned in the last few decades is that for most folks, ADHD persists into adolescence. <clears throat> into young adulthood and uh, across the lifespan um, such that if a child has ADHD, it's often the case that one of their parents does as well. And um, when thinking about treating adolescents with ADHD, we often have to decide what is our goal for therapy. And I like to think about the goal being trying to get kids onto a healthy trajectory so that by the time they're 18 and they're um, ready to sort of launch into adulthood, that they have the skills and the tools and the mindset that they need to be successful. And if we think about, um, you know, out of 10 kids with ADHD, what percentage of them are likely to be able to learn to manage their symptoms and, and be somewhat successful as adults? And what percentage of them are still going to struggle as adults? More or less right now, we see it's about a 50-50 split. And so in this case, I'm thinking about clinical treatment of adolescents with ADHD as having a goal of trying to move as many kids as possible onto this more um, remitting trajectory of ADHD or this trajectory where you learn to manage your symptoms over time. And so the question then becomes, you know, as clinicians, what can we do to increase the likelihood that a teenager will move on to this trajectory where they learn to manage their symptoms over time? And of course, as somebody who's also a researcher, uh, when I started working out uh, what this treatment could look like, uh, one of the first things that I did was read a lot in the research literature about what we already know are kind of key factors that influence trajectory of ADHD. And there wasn't much out there, um, you know, and a lot of it was sort of generic, like the more severe that your ADHD is, the more likely it is to persist long term, you know, more comorbidities, uh, more mental health problems at home. But one of the ones that really stuck with me was that the adolescent age group actually really does have a big impact on adult trajectory. And when teens with ADHD fall into negative um, outcomes like uh, for example, not finishing high school or getting kicked out of the house or um, getting a drug problem or maybe getting pregnant or getting someone pregnant. These are the types of events that really can derail their trajectory that even if they can, you know, be working to overcome their ADHD symptoms, sometimes the negative things that can happen to them as teenagers don't put them on a course to have an easy path to success um, in our society. So really thinking about this adolescent period as an important time to be delivering treatment to teenagers. And with ADHD, I mean, we, we really think about it 
using models and there's a lot of models out there for understanding ADHD and they're all good. They're all right. Um, and one model that I think really helps us think about how to treat teenagers with ADHD is this distinction between um, cool executive functions and sort of a hot reward circuitry in the brain as being two kind of uh, cognitive, neurocognitive um, circuits that are implicated in ADHD. And if we can try to intervene on both of these core areas of deficit, uh, we're probably gonna be setting kids up to have uh, success going through their teenage years. So the first of course is the executive function deficits, which I think are really prominent for any of you all who've worked with teens with ADHD. And I think it's important to note that in adolescence, you see a lot of typically developing teens struggle with executive functions, right? And I think probably everyone here maybe has heard this idea that for teenage brain development, it's the brain's developing from the back to the front. So of course, the very last thing that becomes fully mature is the prefrontal cortex, which houses these executive functions. So whereas the teenage brain is becoming adult-like in a lot of ways, it's lagging behind in terms of its ability to, um, to show full strength of areas like working memory and um, behavioral inhibition and um, the ability to self-monitor and organize and plan. And then if you have ADHD, you have double impairment. So you not only have sort of that teenage you know, deficit, but then you have ADHD on top of that. So that's a real area of impairment. And then the other side of things has to do with the dopamine pathways and how that's related to rewards responding in ADHD. And um, one of the things that you see in teenagers is prominent motivation problems stemming from difficulties with response to rewards. When, when the kids are younger, a lot of times we, we think of it as having trouble following the rules or we think of it as um, you know not being able to get work done, but because the expectations on a teenager are that you need to make your own decisions about when you do things and you need to you know, self-regulate, um, you know, that same deficit really sort of becomes perceived as and looks like a difficulty with motivation. So we're interested in sort of treating both of these areas to hopefully be maximally effective. One of the more validating pieces of research that I've read here in terms of like potentially justifying this type of approach uh, was in a longitudinal neuroimaging study by Sean colleagues. And um, what I think is interesting here is that the red line is, is kids who had ADHD that persisted into adulthood. And the blue line are typical kids without ADHD. Now the green line are the remitters. So these are folks who had ADHD in childhood and you know managed to overcome and manage their ADHD well enough as adults that they no longer met criteria for the disorder. And in the neuroimaging, they actually saw that uh, there was normalization in the prefrontal cortex compared to the non-ADHD kids over time. And these were not kids who were getting any sort of intervention. But if we were able to replicate that and find ways to strengthen um, you know, connections in the prefrontal cortex through some sort of psychosocial intervention, um, then potentially this would be a good intervention strategy to move kids onto that trajectory. So uh, then here we are left with the question. So what can we do to move kids onto that positive trajectory? And um, so thinking about in terms of building any intervention, whether you're a researcher who is trying to like come up with something novel and test it out, or you're a clinician who's trying to take all of the different tools you have available to you and put them together in a way that best serves a patient. Um, thinking about how we think about intervention, and I take, I take this framework from Jeff Cohen's work at Stanford, but we wanna you know, be thoughtful about the mechanisms and what we're trying to actually help um, somebody improve. And we wanna be um, picking things out that are strategic. We wanna deliver the intervention in a context where we think that the um, patient will be likely to engage well with it and receive it and be able to um, you know, complete it. And then we also wanna think about timing. So delivering treatment during a time period where you might have the most bang for your buck for making a difference in someone's life, especially when you're talking about a chronic disorder like ADHD, where um, you know folks may have difficulties for, for years and years of their life, but not necessarily would it be appropriate to give them treatment every day of their life. So uh, out of this you know, framework, there were two target mechanisms selected for the stand intervention. And one was organization and time management and planning skills, which is 
teaching kids a way to compensate for their executive function deficits instead of directly trying to remediate the deficits. We hope that by teaching kids ways that they can manage their difficulties, perhaps over time, that will allow them to develop the neural connections that they need to strengthen the ability to actually um, do some of these executive functions successfully. And if not, they've got some good coping strategies. So you imagine if somebody's very forgetful, teaching them they need to learn to write things down habitually. Um, if somebody's messy and loses their stuff and, um, you know, is always misplacing things, coming up with an organization system that's systematic and teaching people how to like try to self-manage and follow that. Um, and we could, we could carry these out with several other strategies, whether it's time management, making lists, teaching to pr how to prioritize and planning, um, putting structure in place. So as I'll show you, there's a number of ways that we would do this. And this slide just shows some research um, that my team did probably uh, seven or eight years ago now, um, where we, we surveyed parents and teachers about the top problems of adolescents with ADHD. And we found that these kind of um, executive functions, especially in the academic domain, really rose to the top of the list for them. Um, the other piece of this is motivation, and motivation is a complicated topic. Uh, I, my my um, analogy for motivation is that, you know, if you lifted up the hood of a car, um, you would see that there's a lot of different things going on underneath the hood. And if anything's broken, the car won't run. But you kind of need everything to be working well and working together to have, you know, a car running well. So with motivation, it's the same thing. There's several motivational components of the brain, you know, cognitively that need to be working well for a teenager with ADHD to be adequately motivated to meet the expectations upon them. So for example, we can think about intrinsic motivation. So just how enjoyable uh, the teens find school, find uh, daily life activities. And when that's lower in people with ADHD, based on the dopamine deficits, um, you know, they're not going to be as self-interested in pursuing and engaging in things like academics um, and extracurricular activities. And so we want to remediate some of these things. Thinking about, um, you know, difficulties with goal formulation, knowing what you're interested in, knowing what you want long term. Um, and if you have executive function deficits, even if you've got goals, it's sort of hard to keep them in mind and think about, you know, why you're doing something, why you're working on something hard or boring, um, what it's in it for you. Um, and there's this other kind of crossover with executive functions with motivation too, right? So we've got like thinking about things like willpower, a person with ADHD has a really hard time um, persisting at difficult tasks, right? That's one of the core symptoms of ADHD. Um, they have difficulty with self-control. So especially with teenagers, resisting the temptation to go on social media, to play video games instead of doing your homework. Um, these are all little pieces of the motivation puzzle. And finally, I think another important part is how teenagers with ADHD think about themselves. So their self-efficacy or the belief that it's worth putting in the effort in school and at home because something good will happen if I actually put in that effort. So all of these things are, um, are shown to be impaired in, in teenagers with ADHD. Um, and so thinking about, is there a package we can put together that addresses some of these things in treatment um, in order to support the use of the skills that we're gonna be teaching kids. And I just put a few research findings up here that I think are you know, interesting. Um, students with ADHD and high extrinsic motivation are more likely to go to college. And on top of that, if you look at college students with ADHD and college students without ADHD, there's actually a finding that college students with ADHD sometimes have higher levels of motivation because if you're a person with ADHD and you manage to get to college, a four-year college, um, you know, in the traditional window of time, that shows that you must really have, you know, something extra going for you that you are able to overcome all the adversity that comes along with ADHD. Um, so I'm not surprised about that finding. Um, goal setting is a really important um, piece of academic success in um, for high school students with ADHD. Um, my team did a study on this a few years ago and found that. Um, and also, uh, we know that self-efficacy is important. So how kids think about their own ability to do work ends up impacting the work that they do in school. <clears throat> So prior to STAND, which we started working on in around 2010, 
Um, the question is, what was the landscape of behavior therapy for adolescent ADHD? And um, so historically, this work started in schools. And so uh, it, there are two school-based programs that are really great. One is called the Challenging Horizons program, and one is called the HOPS program. And both of these programs are de designed to be delivered by school professionals. And they um, you know, kind of fit within what you'd expect maybe a special educator to do, um, you know, helping kids with their organization skills to monitor them, to reinforce them um, in the school setting. And um, historically, this is something that would be done, you know, in school-based settings, but not necessarily in clinic settings. That was sort of something where there wasn't a good toolkit yet. And I mentioned a second ago, but I'll reiterate, we're thinking about things like organizing book bags, writing down organization, um, learning how to plan and prioritize, learning how to set good routines at home for things like homework, um, teaching study skills, which address all of these components address sort of like teaching kids skills in an area that could help them overcome their deficits. But they don't have that motivation piece in a really structured, uh, like, full intensity way. And so although, um, you know, with with constant monitoring by school staff, we saw kids succeeding. The question has always been, if you took away that monitoring, um, will kids do this stuff on their own and will they do it long term? And so that is where STAND, I think, is trying to help make a difference in skill application outside of session and long term after treatment's over. Um, so then we'd have to look at, well, what are the motivation interventions for adolescents with ADHD that might help us with that? Now, of course, we can go back to the very classic work of Jerry Patterson and um, looking at how you take contingency management and reward systems using operant principles and make them adolescent appropriate. Um, and so this model would be thinking about like using a behavioral contract between a parent and a teen to set up expectations and consequences um, that could be positive for meeting those expectations. <clears throat> and so here we can address at least short term extrinsic motivation. So like just short term, you know, if you do your homework, then you can go play video games. But we don't know whether this addresses some of those more internal cognitive pieces of motivation. And we also don't know whether once we took the contract out of place, would the teenager have any personal reasons to keep doing the skills? We don't know. So as a result of sort of this landscape, there were some clear practice gaps um, when we started developing STAND that we tried to overcome. Um, and so this is combining the organization piece with the motivation piece. So prior you had like the organization skills interventions which were mostly driven by a lot of good consistent monitoring by school staff. And then you also had these separate motivation type interventions that were very behavioral. And usually they're focused on disruptive behavior or um, you know, home routine stuff, but not necessarily teaching the kids skills that they could use to hopefully internalize some of what the good behavior um, they need to do and how they do it. So if we could put those together, maybe that's a good package. Um, so, and. And so um, I think, you know, there, the manuals out there for HOPS, for Challenging Horizons programs, Defiant Teens, which is Barclays um, Teen Intervention for ADHD, are really good. Um, and they all kind of laid the foundation for what we decided to do with STAND. Um, now, the other piece I want to talk about is treatment engagement for adolescents with ADHD, because um, that the other half of the landscape is it's great that we have these tools, but can we get kids to engage in them and use them? So just a few comments on this. Um, so here we can see that treatment utilization in childhood is better than it is in adolescence, at least um, by a small amount, and that's for both medication and behavior therapy. Um, this is a sample uh, in Florida where they found that while most adolescents with ADHD have had lifetime treatment, the majority are not receiving it presently. So a lot of kind of childhood history of treatment, but not necessarily receiving adolescent specific treatment. And this is either medication or behavior therapy. Here from the MTA study, um, we see that medication use for adolescent ADHD goes down tremendously from childhood. Um, and uh, to the extent that only 17% of the 16 year olds in the sample were still receiving stimulant medication after most had been medicated in childhood. And um, 
the MTA had an interesting study looking at the reasons for uh, discontinuing stimulant medication. And even though we're talking about behavior therapy here, I'm pretty sure we can translate this mindset over to behavior therapy a little bit too, right? So I think I can manage without it. I wanted to find out if I could manage without it. I was tired of taking it. I don't, I'm doing so well. And I, for that last comment, I just want to direct you to this right graph where we can see that in this sample, they actually weren't doing so well. So, um, you know, there's sometimes a misperception between, you know, how you're doing and, um, and what teens with ADHD, how they self-perceive. Um, and in this study, we can see that both for medication and behavior therapy, across these panels that teens with ADHD are much less willing to engage in treatment than their parents are, their teachers are, and their providers are. So there's certainly a person specific kind of gap here with interest in treatment. And in Barclay's 2001 study, he had two arms. One was delivering uh, behavior therapy for adolescent ADHD just to the parent. And the other was to deliver it to the parent and the teen together. Um, and here you see that retention was much poorer when you brought the kid into the mix. When you were just working with the parent, retention was better. So these are some of the challenges that we're going to be facing if we're trying to bring the parents and the teens together for this type of treatment that we think is needed. Um, and so we really need to be coming in with an engagement strategy that could address some of these concerns. Now, if you wanna ask me um, what I think are some of the barriers to engagement in this population, um, I made this slide a couple years ago and we've since got a paper under review that actually looks at this stuff in a really systematic way. But the findings of that paper are pretty consistent with what's on this slide. So I think some of the top engagement difficulties on here are parenting conflict, mindsets and cognitive belief that make people hesitant from fully leaning in and putting a lot of effort into behavioral uh, plans and strategies. Um, of course, you're gonna have more issues with consistency of routine and demands when you are entering adolescence. For one thing, a lot of parents go back to work um, full time when they have teenagers who can start taking care of themselves more. So less frequently do you have a second parent at home who can pick up kids from school and watch them while they're doing homework. A lot more kids are independently at home for hours by themselves. So parent and teen schedules don't always line up, which makes it hard to do behavior therapy when the target's something like homework. Um, you've got issues with the teens having trouble self-perceiving, with parent beliefs that, you know, if change isn't immediate, that then what's the point of doing this treatment? Maybe it's not working. Um, we also have a lot of parent concerns to manage. Parents uh, who would rather put out uh, try to put out fires and deal with the, you know, crisis of the week than like a long-term learning of skills. So we definitely have um, some work cut out for us in terms of overcoming some of these barriers if we want to really successfully engage with the population. And I think to take that a step further and thinking about parental um, challenges and barriers, one of the biggest things I've noticed with parents of ADHD, with, of kids with ADHD, is just the, the number of dilemmas they really have to face that don't have clear answers. And often this is what they want to spend time talking about in treatment, things like how much should they be letting the kids be independent versus, you know, helping them? If helping them helps them get good grades, but it's not fostering autonomy, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, you know, should I be sticking to rules at home, even though uh, it, it causes big fights? You know, how do I pick battles? Um, how do I decide, you know, if we should be prioritizing homework over getting enough sleep? So there's so many things that parents are struggling with. Um, and so if you have folks who, you know, come to treatment and there's certain things they want. And then we're coming to treatment as providers saying, but I think there's certain things you need. How do you navigate that? And so that's a piece of um, what we're trying to think about and stand. Um, I do like showing a couple slides on this. Um, so we did a latent class analysis, uh, I think 2016, so about five years ago, where we had 300 families of teenagers with ADHD, and we wanted to see where there are any common patterns with how the parent is parenting teenagers with respect to their school academic involvement. And we ended up finding four patterns, uh, which I can kind of narrate for you here. Um, you see the orange line real prominently here. So I'll start with that. This is a group of parents who do everything. They help all the time. On the left, we have kind of the assistance type um, behaviors, like helping to plan things out and organizing things with the kids and helping with homework. On the right, we have more of the behavioral strategies. So they're just trying everything. Uh, we kind of see these 
in our, um, when we look deeper, it's kind of like a parental helicoptery type pattern. I'll show you in a second. Um, we've got the yellow line, which is the other easier one to describe. These folks aren't doing too much. A lot of them have kind of disengaged from, you know, being involved at all. Um, and then our blue and our silver lines are people who are doing a moderate amount of helping, which we kind of like. Um, but the difference between them is the amount of behavioral strategies they're using. So helping plus, you know, having rules at home and having a, a consequences to hold kids accountable or helping plus none of that. And um, the silver group is interesting because they're also the group that's most likely to take over and do kids homework or assignments for them. So why this is important to stand is that we're going to have all of these types of parents walking in the door and we've got to have a treatment that's ready to meet the needs of any of them. And you may need to be, um, you know, taking a very different approach for the over involved parent who needs to step off and give more autonomy than you would to the parent who hasn't even checked the kids grades in a year. <clears throat> and I always just have some little cartoon slides and the different parenting groups, but you can see the the prevalence here. So the parental control is about 20%. Um, and you can see the mindset that may lead to this is just being scared that your kids will fail if you don't help a lot. Um, the homework assistance, that's the silver line. So a lot of monitoring, a lot of helping, but not necessarily, you know, consequences and holding kids accountable for things. Um, and we have the uninvolved, which is the most prominent group. So 40% of the families um, at this age had you know, had kind of checked out and weren't doing much at all. Um, and we think maybe one mechanism of this is could be just trying to avoid arguments or the stress of seeing bad grades. Um, and so in the, uh, the healthy group, the parent team collaborative group was about 20% as well. Um, so here we have all these different barriers that I've just kind of gone over. And so it, the kind of key point here is that Treating a teen with ADHD is not going to be as simple as just teaching some skills and then coming up with some rewards for using those skills. There's a whole real life experience of having ADHD in adolescence that's shared by the parent who's, you know, there every day. And these are the things that are really kind of prominent for them. And so if we can't um, navigate through these in treatment, then we're probably going to see that poor engagement that so historically has been documented both for medication and behavioral treatment. So then the challenge became, can, can we create like an engagement focused behavior therapy for adolescent ADHD that, you know, targets these mechanisms that we think will be effective and gets folks to stay in treatment and engage and try out, you know, things at home that might take effort. Um, and so we hypothesize that if we, you know, searched for therapeutic engagement components that, you know, could be effective, um, we could engage people better and therefore even in, uh, increase the efficacy of what we're doing. So this is what led to sort of the formulation of STAND, which is a 10 to 12 um, week clinic-based treatment. We see the kids for about maybe 50 minutes each session. Um, it's really, you know, kind of branded as engagement focused, engagement forward here. Um, the parent and the team come in together at the same time and meet with a clinician, like a a dyad and we're targeting executive functions and motivation. And so what we have done to really pull in this engagement piece, piece is to blend the treatment with motivational interviewing. And so the therapists are trained to use an MI style while delivering stand throughout. It's not gonna be one of those kind of MI, two sessions of MI plus treatment. It's literally blended. So the whole time you're doing treatment, you're using MI. And this has been sort of the empirical question is, does that help? Um, so just to give you a little roadmap here, in STAND, we've broken treatment into three phases. In the engagement phase, the chief goal is just um, to help the family members find an interest in being a part of treatment and being willing to do some work in treatment um, to help them find sort of personal goals and reasons why they want to engage. In the, the middle part, we teach those skills that I mentioned. Uh, the families pick off of a menu as part of the engagement piece, which of the skills they think they'd like to learn. And then the therapist can go through those modules with them. And then finally, uh, the third phase is about um, pulling together what was learned and what's desired and trying to create kind of like a, a structured plan for the family that may involve a school component if that's appropriate. Um, that's, that sort of looks like a contract at the end, 
and um, hopefully to also spend some time um, thinking about how you'll maintain that after you're done with treatment. Now, big part of treatment is practicing at home. And so that is sort of one of our main pieces here is like just working to get families in between sessions to try new things and to see how they're working. So the MI piece, just a, just a slide or two on that. Uh, so uh, probably in here, there's people with various levels of familiarity with motivational interviewing, but I'm gonna pull some of the key points related to this population and stand itself. So knowing that there's a lot of um, barriers for this population, you know, we're honoring the family's autonomy and knowing what strategies they need right now and what would work best for them. Um, that self-efficacy piece that I mentioned, we can target that through MI, we can teach therapists to use communication strategies that make them feel, make the family members feel like, you know, they're, they're capable and that they can make progress. Um, the empathy piece of MI is really great for this population, teens who often have um, shown deficits in self-esteem because of the negative feedback their environment is constantly giving them because they make a lot of mistakes and they don't meet the mark and they um, say things that make people laugh at them. And so they kind of do develop this negative self-concept and having an empathic therapist um, can be really meaningful for someone who feels like that, as well as their parents who may be embarrassed about certain parenting behaviors that they feel you know, compelled to display because of the, the challenging family situation. And of course, uh, as a core component of motivational interviewing, surrendering that expert role so that, um, and I think that's important because there's oppositionality that can emerge here, right? The, a lot of the teens kind of have ODD. Um, sometimes there's the oppositionality from the teen to the parent that the therapist has to try to cut through a little bit. And sometimes there's parent oppositionality to the therapist after feeling like they've tried behavioral therapy multiple times and like you already know it doesn't work so why are we trying this again so being able to take off that expert role and say i don't know best here but i want to help you guys find what's going to work for you can be effective um, and then of course the technical components of motivational interviewing involve uh reinforcing language about change in order to help people feel um like they can move in a positive direction. So here we're thinking about um, getting people to think about po change positively. Um, we're getting people to become more aware of their personal goals and values and how that might make uh, you know, the positive steps we could make in treatment personally pay off for them. Um, and also reinforcement of even the smallest steps people make um, to help families gain momentum, even when um, they're starting from a place that feels really um, hopeless sometimes for them. So, uh, you know, I'll just show you a little glimpse of a few what this looks like in practice. So we have got different um, activities we do in stand that are structured. Some of them are optional. Some of them are standard. Um, here you can see an example of a, a way to start a conversation going about values and getting kids to pick out a couple things that are important to them right now and talk about it so that the therapist has an opportunity to think about how they can link treatment to those things that the kids care about. Um, it's a strength-based approach, which is important for that self-efficacy piece uh, for making kids feel like, you know, little steps they take matter and count, even if there's still like things that are not going well for them. Um, and this goes for, you know, affirming the parents as well. And the practice activities are such an, uh, an core component of stand. So having, um, you know, the families come up with their own practice activities any, every week instead of giving standardized homework assignments um, and helping people think through with motivational interviewing what it's going to look like, what their reasons are for wanting to do this and having them kind of own what they're committing to. Um, this always links back to goals that family members set. Uh, and the parents are setting goals for themselves as parents, like, you know, giving him more space or maybe, um, you know, monitoring him better. And the kids are also having their own goals for themselves, which are not necessarily, you know, the most impaired target behaviors. What they are is that they're the things the kid is most willing and interested in working on, because that's how you build engagement. Instead of forcing the therapist's agenda on them, you know, you, you see where, they, where they're willing to do some work and you start there. And then from there, you know, if you get that opening and you get that good rapport going and some of that success happening, you may be able to circle back with some of the things that you think are really indicated um, afterwards. <clears throat> so here we use a menu-based approach and have the families pick a couple things they want to learn. And then, um, you know, the therapist can negotiate that with them. There can be some shared decision-making where the therapist can share what they think might help the most. But ultimately that 
that's a negotiated set of modules for treatment that the family has, you know, their reins with. When we're, uh, we've done a lot of work on the process of assigning homework and the process of reviewing homework in a way that increases the likelihood that people will follow through on homework and subsequent homework. So, you know, we think a lot about, you know, setting implementation intentions when people uh, are, are going to do a home activity. We spend five to 10 minutes just thinking about exactly what it's going to look like, what you need to do it, how it's going to work, when you're going to do it. And then um, we do like a cognitive walkthrough of all the barriers that might come up too to get them to think through what happens if you forgot your cell phone at school and that was like you know the reward for tonight or what happens if um, you know you, you realize that you have a huge project due tomorrow um, and so now you can't do the homework you had committed to and get the family members to think through like how am I going to handle that ahead of time so that when the barrier occurs they already thought it through, or um, it even normalizes the problem solving process. So this is all sort of engagement components focused on um, improving um, like how people proceed through treatment. And then of course, just borrowing from like that Patterson model, the parent team contracting where the parent and the team come together as equals. Um, you know, they both may need to compromise to reach a shared goal. Um, you know, the behavioral piece of this is contingent rules, right, at home. But then again, the, the teen should have access to new privileges that might be exciting and not what they usually get if they will commit to the rules. So hopefully both parties get something out of this, um, which is what that says. And we have a piece in stand where we also like want to check on the autonomy support component, especially with a contract, which could be like kind of imposing something on a kid. So there's also some specification of what the parent's gonna refrain from doing. So maybe no reminders, maybe I won't nag you um, to, to iron out that piece. So I did wanna show, and it looks like I've got time, um, maybe a quick video clip, just so you can see a little bit about what Stan looks like. Um, so I might just show a couple minutes of this um, for you all just to get a glimpse, and then I'll share some research on Stan. Um, so I'm just gonna switch over to a video real quick. Okay, so we could start out by looking at the, the letters that you guys wrote. Um, and you Let me just optimize this for um, audio real quick. Here we go. Okay, perfect. All right, this should be good. Pulled those out right away. Yes. So I think uh, it's up to you, Matthew, if you wanna start by showing us what's in your letter or asking mom to start. Mom, you start. Okay. So I wrote, <clears throat> just as with money, other things in your life, things will get money? easier. Did you say money? No. Why are you interrupting me? Okay, I'm sorry. Continue. Just as with many other things in your life, things will get easier. There is so much hope. Parenting is still a challenge, but things are better. You must put consistency and routine into your efforts. This is a must for Matthew. You must tone down your approach when he doesn't perform well with school and responsibilities. Take some time for yourself. All of what is happening for you is not going to be the end of the world. Just do your best and you will get through it. Have patience. Oh, I like a lot of that. Do one of those three years count as this year? Yeah, I could. Oh, I so um, listening to that, it seems like you, you kind of have um, a lot of confidence and hope that um, that you can do this and you can meet some of those goals that you set for yourself. I hope so. And a lot of it also has to do that I've already gone through this mm -hmm. once before yeah. and, and things did turn around for us. So I'm really hopeful that things will be similar. You saw that your whole family was successful once with your older son. Yeah. And so you kind of feel that, um, that sense that it, it's going to be okay again. Yeah. And um, one of the things you mentioned in there was to make sure you took some time for yourself, too. I want to hear a little bit about that part. Um, just for me, I mean, I take on a lot of the, the issues in the family. Um, my husband's a lot more laid back, so he's kind of not like, like in the middle of everything like I am. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not good for me to not just have time for myself. 
and and really right now like the only time really that I have by myself is just driving to and from work and you know stuff like that but I think it's important just for my own personal being to mm-hmm. to start looking into doing that and and being I think that'll make a benefit to other situations if I'm not already like I don't know what what the right word is. Like, you know, too much into other stuff. So I'm already, like, you know, at level nine when I could be, you know, at level two. So when you if you took space for yourself um, and you kind of took care of your own well-being, that that would translate into, as a parent, um, you know, just sort of reflecting that well-being with the kids. And, yeah. and that could benefit them in certain ways. Sure. So I'm just pausing there. You just get a little a little sneak peek of what Stan looks like today, but um, you saw that the parent has a goal for herself. That's not necessarily a goal for her child. And that's to build parent engagement so that, you know, there's something in it for her where she can feel like she got something out of this. Um, Okay. So let me just make sure I got the right screen shared here for you guys back into the slideshow. So um, a little bit on the research So we have done a number of studies on Stan, but I'm gonna show you the main RCT, the larger one done in the university setting. That this was published in 2016. We had 128 kids, uh, age 11 to 15, and um, they all met criteria for ADHD. In this study, our design was a Stan group and then a group that was treatment as usual, which basically meant um, kind of a list of uh, services available in your community that you could then take and proceed with whatever you felt um, you wanted to uh, pursue. And so there was random assignment to the two groups with measurement of outcomes at baseline, post-treatment and six months after treatment ended. And uh, our sample was, uh, it was conducted in Miami, Florida. So this is majority Hispanic sample, middle class. Uh, They have comorbidities uh, across the board here and about a third of them were medicated, which uh, if you saw the data early on medication assistance in teenagers, that's about what I usually get in my adolescent ADHD samples that are recruited from communities instead of like directly from a primary care clinic or somewhere where they might be more likely to be medicated. Uh, For this type of research, we get a lot of different outcome measures because the kids are struggling in several different domains. They also uh, are seen by different people throughout the day and are not good self-reporters. So we have parent report, teacher report, self-report, direct observation, and we kind of just try to uh, put together the picture of what's changing by looking at things from these different angles. And so uh, some of the key findings of the study were uh, that there was strong fidelity to the uh, topics that the therapists were supposed to talk about and also adequate motivational interviewing um, fidelity as well. Uh, we had 85% of the families complete all the stand sessions. So that's an improvement upon the Barkley study, which sort of was our benchmark for what we needed to at least do. Um, and we were really focused on engagement. So we were glad to see this. On average, the families all had eight sessions of stand um, and we're generally pretty satisfied. Um, Here we can see the pattern of our results. So um, these are effects with significant maintenance over time out to the six month follow-up, which included um, ADHD symptoms according to the parent, uh, the parent's stress level, parent use of behavioral strategies and the kids organization time management and planning problems. Here we can see effects that uh, got better during treatment and did not maintain. So this would be some of the, uh, like the writing down the homework strategy, which they seemed to improve during treatment. And then afterwards they were not doing that anymore. Um, the disruptive behavior symptoms, which I think for this effect, like very few of the kids had disruptive behavior to begin with. So it's sort of smaller, but Um, And then the parenting contracting. So interestingly enough, if we go back to the last slide, they were using the contingent home privileges, but they weren't necessarily formalizing it in a contract as much anymore. Uh, Here we have either small, like smaller effects or non-existent effects. So I think uh, any effects under 0.4, our study wasn't really powered for. So you can see the small effect that we made on grade point average and book bag organization um, without really a meaningful effect on parent-teen conflict, according to the teenager. 
um, or ADHD symptoms according to the teacher. And I somehow lost my favorite slide, but I do think an important piece with stand is like the transition of power from the parent to the teen. And what I mean by that is I have a quote from a parent from Stan that says um, he's still getting B's, but now it's his B, not my B. So I think that's important when you think about, you know, improvements in the school setting and what exactly they are and what they look like uh, to understand sort of that shift that's often occurring in a lot of families um, when we increase the autonomy that the kids have. Just a couple other things. Uh, so we did a study a couple years ago looking at whether a group version of STAN could be effective. Uh, obviously, this is more cost effective for clinics. Um, and so we had 123 kids either randomly assigned to stand or a group version of stand um, that we adapted. Um, now, the, there's no MI in the group. Uh, the process is very different. We're relying on the group process of like, you know, parents getting to know each other and hearing, you know, each other's stories. But what we found is that there was equal effectiveness overall between the two programs, except when you had more complicated folks, the dyadic stand was better. So here you see that if the parents had ADHD themselves, the dyadic version, the standard stand was better. Same if the parent had depression and same if there was high parenting conflict. So this is good. It's a beginning of an understanding of who to route to where. Um, so we, I like doing this type of work and hopefully can do some more of it. Uh, the last five years have been spent trying to adapt stand for community uh, settings where they're under resourced clinics, kids who are, you know, usually on Medicaid, um, providers who have um, low resources available to them. And so we're, this is a, this is like an ongoing process, but we did finish up an R01 and publish some initial results out of it um, in a few different papers. So I'll just show you a little bit about that real quick and then take questions. Um, so in that study, we had 278 um, adolescents with ADHD who were incoming patients at four community mental health agencies in Miami. Um, we also had 82 community therapists involved. And they, the kids were assigned, randomly assigned to stand with a community clinician who'd been trained in stand or usual care services at the agency. So then they got a clinician who had not been trained in stand. And uh, same sort of design following up at baseline post-treatment. And I think at this, in this study, it was like three month follow-up, uh, same types of outcomes as I showed you before. And here uh, you can see uh, we have a sample again, that's primarily uh, Hispanic, except the difference here is that um, they were a lower income sample um, compared to the other one. And of course the clinicians are acting in a lower resource setting. The therapists sort of matched uh, the, the kids and demographics, I think, overall. But what's interesting is in this workforce, they're mostly not licensed, um, which become ends up becoming an interesting factor in what we found. Um, so here we found uh, some interesting things. So the therapist engaged, they liked learning about stand, they came to supervision, they had positive opinions of stand. Um, they had good fidelity until the planning phase, the last four sessions where they're trying to put it into practice with the families and then the fidelity was horrendous. So that's one of the things we're working on now. Uh, they, they struggled a little bit to assign home practice to make sure that they're consistently talking about therapy goals. Um, they also delivered treatment in a slower pace. So sometimes they didn't get through all the content and what that was scheduled for a session. So they took a second session to do that content. Um, we don't necessarily know that that's a bad or a good thing, but that was just something different that happened in this setting. Um, sometimes they change the sequence of the tasks based on their intuition of what might work better with a family. Again, that may not be a bad thing, but we're learning about what, what community folks do with the treatment. And then we found that fidelity was best in uh, the earlier sessions of treatment and also when it was delivered in an office based uh, versus a home. So a lot of times they were delivering these, the treatment in the home and that could be a chaotic environment. Um, the MI scores were actually higher in the stand group based on our recordings of their sessions versus the usual care recordings, which shows us that there was learning of MI and applicability of MI, um, but they were lower scores than in our university trials. So maybe a watered down version. Uh, so the overall effects across our outcomes, and I just put a couple of things here for you guys to look at, um, was that 
first of all, I should mention about 20% of the kids in both groups never received a single session of therapy because they disengaged from treatment altogether before their first session, which is something that we wanted to capture because this is what happens in community settings. Um, a lot of folks will do the intake with the agency. That's the point at which we met them. And then they never came back for therapy. Um, but even among the per protocol, so those are the kids who did at least get one session, we found um, that there was no effect of stand in, um, in the usual, sorry, in the community setting, unless the therapist was licensed. And then we saw our usual um, effect for stand that we've seen in our previous studies. So this is really interesting. And we asked to ask ourselves, what are the licensed people bringing to the table that's making them be able to do this treatment effectively, but the unlicensed folks were not. Um, and so uh, there were some secondary outcomes though that I think are interesting here. So for one, uh, there was no difference in treatment initiation or no number of sessions received in the two groups, but parent engagement was substantially higher for STAND. A lot of the usual care services were just working with the youth without any parent involvement. Parents were more satisfied with STAND than usual care, um, potentially because they were more involved. Um, and we also found a really interesting effect on medication engagement where, um, and that's the picture that you can see here. Um, surprisingly to us, because we hadn't hypothesized this, one of the ways Stan did seem to be effective in community settings was in keeping kids on their meds. Um, and maybe this is because stand is engaging the parent to think about, um, you know, and the kid to think about being motivated to be treated and to get better at your ADHD and setting up more structure at home. And some of those things might also uh, set, set one up to be successful. It's, you know, receiving their medication with adherence. So that's something to, you know, for us to look more into in the future. But what we're doing right now is we're piggybacking off of the community study um, and we have an, I have an R34 with some colleagues where we have uh, brought in machine learning um, technology to basically provide fidelity feedback to clinicians in pretty much real time. So maybe a day later um, on their stand sessions. So they audio record them, they upload them into a portal where there's um, all these sort of resources to deliver stand and then they get um, feedback on their MI and also whether or not they stayed on topic and got through the content um, that they can then discuss with their supervisors to hopefully help, you know, with the learning and launching of the treatment a little bit better. We also made some adjustments to the implementation strategy of STAND um, when, we, when we're doing the second go in community mental health right now, which has um, been interesting and in working with stakeholders to do that. So we're working on this still. This is something that we've got our kind of sleeves rolled up on and it's really fun and good work. So I'll stop there. You know, my acknowledgements here, are all the families that were part of this work, our funding agencies, um, and also uh, there's been some real active collaborators over the years that have contributed a lot of important, you know, ideas to this work and, and efforts to this work. So I'm thankful for all of that. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sibley. Um, please um, feel free to unmute yourself. We have a, a good sized group, but I think we could manage. If you have any questions. Well, I, I have a lot of questions and I don't want to hog it. So maybe I'll just- I can count on you, too. Elizabeth. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, oh, so interesting, Maggie. Thank you so much. Um, so my first question is about um, like age as a moderator, because it looked like in your dyadic, um, study that kids were 11 to 15. So I'm assuming that's kind of up through ninth grade or maybe 10th grade. And then in the group, they were, um, uh, uh, you know, up through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. So do you, are there any, like, rec, you know, does this treatment work better with kids of a cert, of certain ages or is it really kind of individual depending where they are kind of developmentally maturity wise? Yeah, okay, a couple of thoughts on that. So we never been able to find age as a moderator in any of these studies, um, but I do think there's something about this age piece. One is that we, we try to make the treatment so it's flexible enough that you can individualize. So I think that some of what's going on is the clinicians are able to like up regulate the treatment to an older kid and therefore mm -hmm. pre prevent the age moderation from being seen. But also uh, when I do stand with older kids, like 16, 17, 18, if 18, 
like in the clinic personally, I'm mm -hmm. always pulling in things from other places. Um, that's never happened in a research study, but mm -hmm. like I do think that there's more that those kids need that's not just in stand. So mm -hmm. like, for example, there's a CBT for adolescent ADHD manual um, that the folks out of Boston have got published mm -hmm. now, which has a few extra components in it that I like cognitive restructuring type stuff that is mm -hmm. stand, but I think is is those older kids are able to handle a little okay. bit and I bring that in. Um, and I think also the thing I always have to help people with in supervision is like reframing the way you talk about contingency management for really older, older kids. kids. Like, yeah. yeah okay. It's not like something we're imposing on you, but I usually have the kids try to do a contract on themselves first for a week without mm -hmm. the parent. And sometimes that goes well and we can keep with that. And other times the fact that it didn't go as well, then, then invites the parent to get involved without mm -hmm. it seeming like you're having them like descend on the kids and start right. like tying their hands behind their back when they're like 17 years old. So. Right. Right. Which is hard. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then kind of a related question and then I'll let somebody else go. So my other kind of moderator type question is a, kind of about those 20% of kids who kind of uh, went through the intake process and didn't come in? Like, are there certain yeah. families who from like the get-go, you know, are not going to be good fits and they would be kind of better for family therapy or, you know, I don't know if you can, if you can tell, you know, upfront who, who this is going to work for and who it isn't. Okay. Yeah. So we just published a paper. I, I don't know if it's out yet. It was just accepted to uh, Orange Journal. And it's like, it was all of the ADHD adolescent studies we did pulled together and mm -hmm. looking at factors that impacted engagement. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the best data I have on your question mm -hmm. besides impressions. Um, so socioeconomic status or like, actually it was a family adversity variable that included, you know, parent education level, if the parent even spoke English, cause we have a lot of immigrant communities in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, if there was a single parent, um, how many siblings there were. So some of those family adversity variables, that was mm -hmm. by far the biggest, the biggest. Okay. Of not engaging well. Okay. Um, beyond that, we had, we had some effects uh, for type of treatment as well, which was interesting. So this, the families that got stand engaged better overall than the families who got um, some like kind of more standard treatments for adolescent ADHD. Mm -hmm. Now that's not a randomized, um, like effect, but it was robust enough that we, you know, we think that that, that maybe Stan protects against some mm -hmm. of the normal dropout because of the early MI in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Yep. We have a question in the chat. Um, Hamilton, if you're still there, you can go ahead and ask it if you want. Oh, sure. Great. Hi, Thanks, everybody. Um, so this was really, really, really good. And we're trying to, I work in primary care psychiatry. Um, well, and, and behavioral health. And so I'm, I'm wondering whether you see aspects of this that we could adapt um, to the primary care setting, what, what parts of it? And then also, um, I, I'm sure you thought about it, but um, any thoughts on how to adapt it to an adult population when you're not working with the, the dyad, but we, we just get so many adults coming. Uh, that's maybe beyond the scope of this, but um, just a curious you know, question. Yeah, I can do a quick answer on both of those and happy to follow up to you for a longer answer. Um, so uh, what, I'm, what I've done a little bit of with collaborators is like a brief uh, intervention that has MI and the parenting contracting piece for um, med adherence for teams with ADHD. So I think that's, that's something you can take from this that's directly relevant to primary care. And then something that um, we're working on in Seattle Children's right now and hopefully going to do a little research on is like a very brief four session parenting group where you teach them kind of the basics of some of this stuff with teenagers and then um, potentially that could be a pre intervention um, to, to engaging um, kids in like a full session of behavior therapy, which might be more um, realistic for delivering in a primary care setting. So those have been the, the main um, directions there. And then um, there, is a, there is a good adult CBT. There's a couple good adult CBT protocols out for ADHD where it's the same kinds of skills, but for the adult setting, um, you know, the motivation piece is always trickier with adults because you don't have a person to leverage to, you know, but, um, but I think they do address that pretty well in those treatments as best as they can. Yep. Really helpful thing. Yeah. 
we're ordering your manuals as we speak. Uh, <laughs> always helpful to keep it in print. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Um, I have a question about the um, adapting to community settings. Um, do you, can you say a little bit about group versus single and dyadic work um, and whether you have an opinion about what would be optimal in a community mental health setting? In my community mental health settings in Florida, which are like these, you know, Medicaid clinics, essentially, they're all on a, like a individual treatment um, model. So they, that's, that's what fits their, like, you know, infrastructure doing the dyadic because they can build family therapy, whereas they have trouble running groups because they can't get people in one place at a time. But like at Seattle Children's, for example, like they only want me to run groups because that works really well for them to have a group and have a ton of people, you know, in it and with billing um, that works better for them. So I think that's why we have the group so that different settings might have different features or characteristics that make one more appealing than the other. Yeah. And have you been doing this virtually? Yes, I, you know what, in 2017, we actually published a paper, like foreshadowing all this, I guess, <laughs> okay. like how to do stand over video conference, wow. it's okay. pretty effective. Thank and then you. that's all I've been doing for the last year. Um, okay. and, you know, luckily, we had already learned some lessons on can it. we refer to you or is your wait list way too long? Well, we can only see people who are living in Washington, ah, okay. our children. So if you know anyone in Washington, okay. Yeah, can refer them. <laughs> okay. um, how can we get trained? Uh, you can email me and I, you know, that can happen in different ways. Uh, sometimes I like contract with organizations to do like a big training for a bunch of folks. And I'm also working on uh, trying to get some online training modules up for people to just do on their own. So that's a future direction. as well. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Um, and someone's asking for the reference for the 2017 telehealth implementation paper. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I can, I'll tell it to you or you can email me, but it's like Sibley, Comer Gonzalez, 2017, Journal of Psychopathology and Behavioral Assessment. Hopefully that gets it to you. If not, email, email me. Awesome. Um, so we have to wrap up. This was so great. Thank you again, Dr. Sibley. Thank you so and much, Maggie. Nice Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.